So 10%. That 10% was put in place since Abraham he gave a 10% portion of all that God gave him. Um, all his sons kept it going. But 10%, that was basically what everybody was doing. But the, the biggest thing about tithing is from the first fruits. When we think about Adam, we think about his two sons, uh, Cain and Abel. When God asked them to work, when they decided to go and give God an actual offering, it was from their first fruits. It was from the first that which they, what they, they cultivated. If it was an animal, the first child that which broke the womb. But God always wants the first. He doesn't want you like going through it saying, should I give this one? Should I give that one? If that first one is bad, give it to him. He wants the first fruits. Um, and that first fruit will never be bad. But we also have to acknowledge that when we give tithing, when we give our offering, it is not as if you are giving it to the church or giving it to the pastor or giving it to the members, but you're actually giving it towards the kingdom of God. Amen. All right. So what I have here, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is tithing makes you wealthy. Amen. It's not a get rich scheme. It's not like you give $50 a day and you get $100 tomorrow. Tithing makes you wealthy. Tithing is about discipline and priorities. Uh, you evaluate your finances as you evaluate your spiritual life. What you invest in today is what you will eat from tomorrow. That's it. Um, le wa bay dim se wa fè de discipline avec priorité ou évaluer finance ou même gens ou dadou évaluer vie spirituelle ça ou investir nan jodi a c'est là dans c'est dans jardin ça wa manger demain so what you invest in today is what you will eat from tomorrow when you invest in foolishness such as fleshly desires clothes jewelry hairstyles i mean you gain the temporary fame. You gain the notoriety that comes with it. But just know that that's your reward. The applause that you get at that moment. Oh, I love the dress. I love the hair. I love the makeup. That applause that you get at that morning, at that moment, is your reward. In the moment that you wear them and all the compliments you receive, after that, it's just collecting dust. No one really cares. Same time. When I said that that was investing basically in foolishness, you invest, you invest into your fleshly desires, which is something that a lot of people do. Um, but when you invest in the kingdom of God, which is spiritually discern, discerned, such as your health, you invest into your future, and you invest into your life, you invest into your goals. From that, you gain wealth both spiritually and financially. So we understand that what we live in today when we look at society is something that we can consider basically a rat race. It's basically like on the hamster wheel. Um, you can work three jobs and still not have no money. You can work basically seven days a week and still be late on your rent. Um, if you get caught up into that rat race, you get caught up into that society, the way that which society has basically implemented things. We look at the cost of living and the way that which it goes up every year with, and it's supposed to, inflation. We acknowledge that if you are not investing in the right things, things are going to be hard for you later. If you are not actually putting your money into something that's actually going to bring back wealth, bring back money, you're going to find yourself hurting tomorrow. Uh, we always, you know, when we go out and we feed the homeless, something that I always acknowledge is that these individuals never planned in their life when they were 16, when they were 22, when they were 25, that, you know what, I'm going to be living in the streets when I'm 40. I'm going to be living in the streets when I'm 50. I'm going to be homeless. 
they never make those type of plans in life. That's that's not a goal for anybody. But not to discredit their life, not to bash them, not to kick them while they're down. But if you sit back and evaluate, you can honestly see that it's the decisions that they made in life that put them in the position that they are in. Not all of them. Not all of them. There are some that just have said, forget society, and they're just going to live in the streets, not pay no taxes. I'm not giving anything to Uncle Sam. But then there are others that which they grew like a, a drug habit. They started taking drugs or they couldn't control their drinking. And because of that, it led to every time they get paid, like I literally watch it in Lake Worth, the Spanish community, men will get paid on Friday, go to the store to cash their check in the same store, buy like two big cases of 24 packs of Corona or Heineken. And as they walk at home, they already starting to drink, meaning that's their first investment. If you really think about it, they, they get paid on Friday and literally their first investment is in beer. If beer was a drink that which promoted health, that's a great investment to make. But we acknowledge that beer is usually just for a pleasure. Beer is just a pastime. Beer is just something to get you by, make you forget about your troubles. Um, and that's their first investment. So that's what we have to start determining in our life today is what are we investing our time in? What are we investing our finances in? And that's what's going to help us grow spiritually and financially. So that's why I say tithing brings wealth. You gain wealth both spiritually and financially when you tithe because you begin to shift your priorities. When you start telling yourself that this beer money can no longer go to beer, I'm going to give it to the church. At that moment, something shifts in your life. Instead of putting this money into things that which are just going to be here today and be gone in a couple hours, I'm going to invest in something that's actually going to be here for the next 10 years, the next 15 years, the next 30 years of my life. So that rat race, a lot of people entered it, but it's not real. It's an illusion. You find yourself in that rat race just because of your bad decisions, and now you have to keep trying to catch up. The whole time, if you would change your decisions, if you would change the way that which you spend money, if you would change the way that which you interact in the world, you would easily leave that race and find yourself on a path that which gains momentum, as opposed to just running in this wheel 24 hours a day and literally not going nowhere. You busy. You 100% busy, but you're not gaining anything. You're not doing anything. You're just moving in place. So that's what we have to get out of. Amen. You're going nowhere fast and you enter into the marathon of growth. No, there's no winners and no losers, just lessons when you enter into the race that we're trying to get into. So the first scripture that we're going to read tonight is in First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 24 through 27. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 24 through 27. I trust in God, my Savior. 24 through 27. He will never fail. It is the first Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. He will never fail. I trust in God. Sorry, can you repeat that, please? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 jusqu'à 27. It says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Amen. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable rep, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. 
I do not box as one who beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Amen. Paul wrote this to the, the church of Corinth, basically telling them there are so many things that you can find yourself doing that is truly not beneficial for you. We all understand that when people get into a race, everybody's racing to win. But the race that which Paul was trying to teach us about here is the is a holy race. It's a race for the kingdom of God. There is no winners in this race. There's no losers in this race. The only thing that you gain from this race is the crown of life. So it's more of a marathon. It's more about just gaining momentum and getting out of the rat race that we just talked about. A lot of people are in that rat race, just going in that circle 24 hours a day and not gaining any momentum, not getting any better. They're, the, they're in the same position they were last year. And it's all because they themselves have not yet made a decision. So when you invest in your fleshly desires, which are clothes, jewelry, hairstyles, you gain temporary fame. But when you invest in the kingdom of God to be spiritually discerned, you invest into your health, you invest into your future, and you invest into your life. You gain wealth both spiritually and financially. There's no winners or losers. Again, it's just lessons. So we are going to talk about when God gave Moses the vision in order to how to build the ark, how to build the tent of meeting, how to build those things that which um, God wanted his congregation to use in order to worship him. Now, when Moses, when God gave Moses the vision on how to build these things, you got to ask yourself, okay, how is he going to get the stuff that he needs to build it? Where is he going to get the stuff that he needs in order to build it? Moses basically told the congregation of Israel, we need supplies, we need gold, we need all these things. So let's go to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35, verse 20. We're going to start at verse 20. Exode 35, commence le verset 20. I trust in God. I so then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. This is after Moses declared to everybody, saying to everybody that, hey, we need supplies. We need everything in order to be able to build up what God has given me the vision to build. So all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him. Hey, Amen. What does that mean to you guys? Whose heart stirred him. Everybody came, the people that which their heart stirred them, meaning that the people that which felt inclined by God to say, I have to give something. So whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting and for all its services and for the holy garments. Amen? So God gave the vision. God told Moses the vision. Um, we read about it last week when we talked about the colors that which God loved, the jewels that which God loved, and all of this, the description and detail of how God wanted these things to be built and how he wanted them to be sold. And God will always provide. Sometimes we think, and with the people of Israel knew this firsthand, that manna would come down from heaven and feed them every morning. Quail would come down every night and give them food for the evening. These things, he wanted the, I would say the church, the congregation, he wanted the people of Israel to basically contribute in order to build them. So given that word out, they with no hesitation went out and basically got everything that they had in their homes, maybe not everything, but what they heart stirred up and their spirit moved them to go and get and they said we're going to bring all the things that which are needed for the tent of meeting and for all the services and all the holy garments so they came verse 22 
both men and women, all who were of a willing heart, brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of, of gold to the Lord. Amen. And everyone who possessed, remember the colors, blue or purple or scarlet yarns or fine linen or goat's hair or tan, or tanned ram skin or goat skin, they brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's contribution. Amen. And everyone who possessed uh, acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. And every skillful woman spun with her hands and they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred them to use their skill spun the goat's hair. And the leaders brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastpiece and spices of oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the, look, for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you can, please speak a little loud. Yes. So that's the difference. The tithing is basically the contribution at which you are inclined to give. You want to give your first fruits. You want to give 10% to God no matter what. These free will offerings have no limitations. It's literally what you feel in your heart that you want to give. You come and you just bring it. Just acknowledging that God said that he wanted to have the scarlet and the purple and the blue yarns in order to make the tent of meeting, the curtains, and in order to make the priestly garments. We acknowledge that, okay, God, you want these things, but where are we going to get it? So they all questioned themselves and said the same thing in order and to, and how you doing? said these things to each other and they all brought it. So when we find ourselves in situations as a ministry and we need things, is it that people aren't listening or not hearing the word of God? Is God not stirring in their hearts to making them do it? Or they, do they just not understand what to give and how to give? Because there's a lot of people that which when God puts it in their heart to come and basically give an offering, they'll feel it in their spirit, give 500 to the ministry. And then in the back of their mind, we go back to what you invest in in life. When you invest into your fleshly desires, such as clothes, jewelry, and hairstyles, you gain temporary fame. A lot of people are after that notoriety. When you invest into the kingdom of God, such as your health, your future, and your life, you gain spiritually and financially, you gain actual wealth. So tithing brings wealth. A lot of people just want fame. So even if they feel inclined at a moment, like God put it in their hearts, so you know what I'm saying? I'm going to contribute. Like youth believe ministry just got a whole church. How much are you guys paying this church every month? Somebody should be asking these questions. Like this should be something on your heart to be like, how can I contribute to make sure that we can always have this comfortable space? So God will put it in their hearts in order to give, but a lot of people are just not inclined to do it because they are still feeding their fleshly desires and those habits. A lot of people are still in that rat race. So when we understand that these women and men are at this moment in the wilderness walking with Moses, they didn't have money, but they had gold, they had silver, they had bronze, those that which were skillful, that could basically, um, that can sew. They like, I right, I don't have anything, but I right, who's bringing the yarn? Let me sew these garments for God. Like they <laughs> gave themselves, they put themselves in service to God. Sorry, could you tell me what verse you're on again? Um, we're we're transferring now. We're going to Exodus 36. So we just read about Moses telling the people of Israel, God wants us to build a tent of meeting. God wants us to build an ark. God wants us to prepare these priestly garments 
of gold, of purple, blue, and scarlet yarns. And everybody basically just started giving everything they had. Like it, it, their spirit moved and they felt the need to give. So now we go, we just, we was in Exodus 35. We're going to go to the next chapter, Exodus chapter 36. We're going to start at verse three. Exodus chapter 36, beginning at verse three. Exode 36, como se nos ve toi. I trust in God, my Savior, the one. Verse 3, Exodus 36, beginning at verse 3. Verse 3 says, And they received from Moses all the contributions that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on, on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning. Amen. Not only did they give one time, all of the people of Israel felt in their hearts that, you know what, we all want to contribute. Now, what are they after? Like, that's what we have to ask ourselves. If I'm just giving something, I'm just bringing my money to people. Like, what, what am I after? When you when you think about the individuals that which they don't give offering to their church, but. Let's say that they go and visit Pastor Greg um, in Tabernacle of Glory in, in Miami, like Shekinah. They'll go to Shekinah. They'll not only go to Shekinah, they'll, they'll get with friends. They'll drive to Shekinah basically an hour, and Pastor Greg will tell them to give $100 because the Spirit of God told him to give $100. These people that don't give nothing but $2 in their church will go down to Pastor Greg's church and give that $100 with no pressure. What are they after? They're after what they know that God provides. They understand that when God speaks, God will bless everything that which you give. Now, we have to be spiritually discerned and understand that you can't go chasing blessings. Amen? These individuals received from Moses the information in order to build something for themselves in order for them to be able to serve their God. And Moses told them all the things that they needed and they all brought it without hesitation. And what we just read here, and I'm going to read it again in verse three, and they received from Moses all the contributions that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free real offerings every morning so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came each from their task that he was doing and said to Moses, the people bring too much. They bring in much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses had to come and give a command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. Amen. They gave so much that they gave too much, sending it. <laughs> they gave too much to the point that Moses had to tell the people to stop because we have enough. You understand? You, understand? you see the leadership? He's not just going to keep taking it and putting it in his pocket. I'm not just going to keep get taking, taking, because oh, I'm going to take advantage of these people that are like, their hearts are open and they feel the need to give. I'm going to just keep taking. No, he understood what the assignment was. He understood his mission and he has understood exactly what he needed. And these individuals were seeking a blessing. That's the only reason that you would be open to get like, okay, some people will say like they go to a church and they see everybody give up, everybody get up and go give off one. Some people sitting in the back and be like, well, everybody done already gave. The church got enough. I don't have to give. These individuals seen everybody giving and still got up to go and give even more. Every morning they were in line to give. Like y'all need more yarn. I got more yarn. Y'all need more gold. I got more gold. What do y'all need? Did y'all pay the lights this month? Let me help. Did y'all pay the, y'all need new chairs? Y'all need a new camera? Like, let me help. They didn't wait. And Moses had to come and tell them, we don't need any more. So the people were restrained from bringing. Verse seven, for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. Amen. So to get back to it, we understand. I don't know about you guys. But I know I knew thieves, I knew jack boys, um, I knew scammers, 
probably still know a couple scammers that I don't know that they scam, but and etc. I'm sure most of you guys know one or a few people that which still, whether it's through scamming or actually sit down, sit down and rob somebody. But if you know anything, you know these individuals for having jewelry. You know these individuals for showing off their money. You know these individuals for having nice cars, whether they rented or bought, whatever, having nice clothes and all these things. Outside of looking in, you see these individuals and you see yourself like they winning. You know what I'm saying? Like the females that scam, they look like they winning. The guys that steal, that rob, they look like they winning. Outside looking in. But again, I want to speak to you guys that which know these individuals. Like if you know people that scam, you know people that are into these type of things, then you know that they stress without control. Like these individuals don't leave their house at certain times, don't go to certain neighborhoods, don't want to be seen by certain people, are always on the lookout to make sure that they're ahead of the game because the law is after them. These individuals will splurge by a new car, by new clothes, by new jewelry, and it would be followed up by their mom getting sick, their brother getting sick, their baby getting sick. Every time, like whether you guys have acknowledged this yet in life, I have totally acknowledged it. When you steal that money that you think that you just won, you end up losing it somewhere. You end up spending it on something that you had no idea was going to come up. Everything was going good for you, just came up off a lick, and now your engine blew. Like something always happens because you're not going to benefit totally from this money. Because what you gain from negativity, you will pay for at the end of the day. There's a lot of people that don't see these things because they're looking at the fact that I still got jury, I still got this, but you sick, bro. Like you probably got early on stage diabetes, like you're going through it, but you feel like you're winning and the world see that you're winning. So we have to start acknowledging and separating ourselves from individuals that are just seeking to get glorified by the world. And we have to stand on the business of God and stop trying to basically get notoriety by these people because you think about yourself if you work a nine to five job you got two jobs you can't compete with a thief you can't compete with a scammer you can't compete with a girl that's on only fans man you won't if you work nine to five waiting on your weekly or bi-weekly check you can't compete with these individuals so trying to look like them you're in that rat race again that's the rat race I'm talking about. You just running in this wheel, this hamster wheel all day long and you're not getting nowhere. You save up three, four checks to go buy a chain just for this scammer to go get a bigger chain. Like who are you competing with? What are you really doing it for? So investments, what you invest in is what I definitely want you guys to take away from this whole study is if you are investing in your fleshly desires, you will gain a temporary, I like that. But if you gain into your into the kingdom of God, spiritually and financially, you will gain wealth. Spiritually and financially, you will go to a new level because spiritually and financially, you will be able to understand, so what? Like, I done made an investment that's going to actually come back to me in 15 years. Like, me putting my money in this high yield, you know, savings account, is going to help me for the next 30 years. I can actually leave something for my grandchildren. I'm not just going to go buy jewelry. I can't leave my jewelry for my grandchildren. Who knows what gold is going to be worth in 30 years? But I can leave a business for them. I can leave wealth for them. I can leave a church for them. That's what we have to start looking at and how do we invest. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. This is off the bat. Proverbs chapter 1. Solomon's words. We're going to start at verse 10. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10. And continuing. Starting at verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, like basically if sinners, people that are living for themselves living for the world come and they tempt you or they trying to tell you like they trying to finesse you to get into what they got going on if sinners entice you do not consent don't fall for it don't follow it if they say come with us 
Let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. These people that scam are scamming innocent people. At the end of the day, you scamming innocent people. You get somebody's social security number, you get somebody credit card information, and you go splurge with their information. Yeah, they might have insurance, but that person going to have to go through some things that they did not have to go through just so that you can go buy or rent a car, just so that you can get some jewelry to go flex. When sinners entice you, do not consent. This Bible verse is saying, let us wait for blood, but we have to look at it in context. Let us wait to get these innocent people without reason. Verse 12, like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole. Like those who go down to the pit, we shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. Basically, come on, slide. We will all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their path. Amen. For their feet run to evil and they make hate to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. Amen. Going back to the jack boys, going back to the scammers, going back to the individuals that steal. They don't win. Sometimes we look and we see them winning the day, but the fall off is going to be crazy. There's too many people that which were up. That were up. Money, houses, cars, go to prison, and the IRS takes it all the way. Impounds everything. You bought your mama a car, they go and take your mama a car back. You bought your mama that house, put your mama name on that house. They're going to take the house and put your mom on the street. You have no money that you can give. These individuals don't see it today because they're only after what is gained today. But what we have learned through life experience and through what scripture is telling us, every sinner that which is doing these unjust things to innocent people in order to be able to bring that plunder to their house are going to pay for it. They're going to lose a hundredfold. When you invest into the kingdom of God, you gain back a hundredfold. You gain health, you gain life, you gain perspective, you gain purpose. If you know anything in life, the older that you get, the more that you start to realize, what do I want to be in life? What do I want to do in life? That type of information is, is so valuable that you can't put a price on it. When you actually find out what I am supposed to do in life, you can't pay for that. People are out here going to gurus, going to these all type of meetings just to sit down and hear people talk about how they became successful because they themselves are looking for success, paying all type of money. When you finally find it, when it finally clicks, there's no, there's no amount of money that you can give. So when you gain purpose, you gain perspective, when you gain direction, it's better than everything. It's better than everything. So again, Investing into the world, investing into your fleshy desires is one thing. Investing into the kingdom of God will always get you up spiritually and financially. Sometimes people think that money can fix everything. But imagine your life today. If you had 100 bands or you had a million dollars, you'd pay off all your debt and be happy. Right? Right? I'm, I'm, I'm flagging. If, if I gave you 100 bands right now, you'll help your daddy. You, you, everybody's straight. Right, Dream? Like, be for real. So a lot of people think that money makes them happy. Money will make me happy. Like, I ain't gonna cap. There's a lot of problems that we have in life. If you have money, it'll help. But just think about the people that have money already. People that, millionaires that can literally go to a dealership, go to the mall and spend 100000 in one day. Black card, just swipe and buy whatever they want in one day. Bank account, Dumb zeros, no pressure. Investment accounts, assets, they have all that they need. And they still go home to emptiness. So we have to stop tying our end goal to money. If you're telling yourself that once I get 100 bands, once I'm up 100 bands with no debt, I'm good, you're going to have another problem. 
That's what life is going to do to you. The goal in life is to find purpose. The goal in life is to find your perspective. The goal in life is to know what am I supposed to be doing? The goal in life as individuals, as we are here, and that actually came to me recently, is to be able to set up our generations to be able to be straight forever. A lot of us only think about this generation. A lot of us only think about ourselves. We're very selfish. A lot of us only think about ourselves. And this is something I was speaking, I spoke to Esther about it, I spoke to my mom about it in, in, in very detail. When you think about the church, this is a bad thing. Also, it's a great thing. The church will live on the fact that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is going to return. We've been hearing it since we were kids. That inclines the individual to only live this life to their fullest. They don't think, like nobody wants to die. So the people that don't want to die tell themselves, like, Jesus is going to come back before I die. So if you have the mindset that the world is going to be ending in the next 50 years, why am I going to make any plans for past 50 years? Why am I going to make any plans for the year 3000? That sounds like, nah, Jesus is going to already be back by then. We'll be in the kingdom with him. But the problem is everybody else is making plans for the year 2000, like the year 2500. Everybody's making plans for them, whether you think about it or not. You think about us as black people. We only think about this year. We don't, we don't even think about 2025. We're only doing everything for 2024. We make no plans for the next 10 years or 15 years. You talk to young people, they don't want to go to school. Like I was talking to one of the singers. She wanted to, she wants to be a lawyer, but now she's considering doing something easier that takes less time because she's in a rush. She won't admit that she's in a rush, but if you knew prior to you saying you want to be a lawyer, it's going to take you six to eight years, run it. But once you start realizing you 18 now in six years, I'm going to be 24. You think that 24 is the end. If you finish at 24 and now you're making $200,000 a year, you'll be making $200,000 a year for the next 15 to 30 years. I'm 36. By the grace of God, I'm healthy. So, chill out. I can see myself at 60 still being healthy. So if I do everything I need to do by the age of 40, I can live a great 20 years. God willing, even more than that. But young people only think that once I get to 18, bro, man, I got to, you know what I'm saying? I got to get this thing done. Like, I, I, I don't have six years to give to no school. You selfish. Real deal. By the grace of God, unless you get sick or like you get shot or you get in an accident, bro. Like, to be honest, you're going to live at least 85 years on this earth, at least, and healthier. Nowadays, because we got so much medication and we got so much technology, I was telling somebody the other day, I feel like by the time we get to the age of retirement and, you know, the nursing home things, it's not going to be nursing homes anymore. I personally feel like it's going to be virtual reality. I real deal feel like they're just going to be giving these old people just some VR sets. I'm telling you, just doing everything for us, bro, by then. So, like, people are going to be living for a long time. So if you're in a rush to get everything done today, like, you ain't going to have nothing to do then. So it's important that we embrace the journey. Because when you're gone, and God willing, Jesus does not come back before we die, we have left children in this world. How are you? What what position are you leaving your children in? You're going to be leaving your, your children to just do what you're doing right now? Like, man, just live for yourself. Don't worry about nobody. Nah, we need to start making decisions for tomorrow. We have to start making decisions for tomorrow. So that came to me literally this week. And that's something that we're going to be talking about more because every other race, especially the Chinese race, they make plans for generations on. And even if you guys think that this is a carnal thing that Gabe is talking about, like, I'm not talking about nothing carnal, because even when you go to the scripture, when you hear how God would say, if the people of Israel follow me, I will bless them, this generation and generation upon generation upon generation for 100 generations after. 
if they do not follow my commandments, I will curse this generation and generation into a hundred generations after. So even God gives us the understanding that our actions, our decisions don't only affect us, but they affect the generations after. We have to acknowledge our parents probably made some bad decisions. But one thing I'm going to always tell you guys, because I'm with y'all, born in America, we're the first generation of Haitians. Whether our parents put us in a situation with no money or not, they invested that trip from Haiti to make sure that we were born in a country that has no limitations. That was their investment. Mm -hmm. That's the plan. Yeah. They literally sacrificed. They, like, they could have been in Haiti, probably had a nice house and could have chilled. But they like, I could live here, but what about my kids? Like, what about Jamima? I have to get to America to make sure that Jamima's straight. To make sure that Jamima's children are straight. You don't see that today. When you get old and have children, you'll start to see it. I don't want you to get to that point at 40 and start thinking about it. Think about it today before you got kids. All your decisions are not only affecting you, Jamima. They affect your children. God already put them eggs inside you. So whenever it's time for these babies to come out, make sure that you put them in a better position than you are in today. All right? What you going to say? Mm hmm Mm hmm which is why they take all their notes and everything. Even presidents. Like Obama, there's a lot of his policies that are literally, they came into play after he left presidency. Obama kept still around. Like Biden is setting up things. Bush, George Bush, he's the one that went over there to the I Iran and basically started the little Middle East war to start getting that oil. We're still reaping the benefits of that. You know what I'm saying? Like making, getting that plug to get that oil. These men understand what generation are they don't just live for themselves we in the black society only live for ourselves and we got to get out of that mindset it's not healthy and it's selfish it's real deal selfish it's very selfish think about it be selfish so the goal is not to be rich it's to be wealthy both financially and spiritually amen so we're going to read malashi chapter 3 Verses 6 through 12. You see, I read all of the other scriptures because I don't want it just to be about what Malachi is about to say. A lot of churches, when it's time for doing off one, these are the verses that they like to read in order to convict your heart. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We oui, exactly. So I don't want I didn't want it to just be inclined to just trying to break your heart. I want you guys to understand that when you invest into the world, you will only gain fame, you'll gain that notoriety for that day, for that year. But you don't gain no wealth for real. But when we invest into the kingdom of God, you actually gain for real. Like you gain life, you gain health, you gain wealth. Real deal. So Malachi chapter three, beginning at verse six. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Amen. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. Amen. We just talked about contributions. We just talked about the people saying that their contributions to the Lord is basically bringing the gold and bringing the the purple and blue and scarlet yarns, bringing the bronze and the silver. God is saying, y'all say, how have we robbed you? Well, in your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tide into the storehouse and there may be a food. And there may be food in my house. Amen. Bring the full tide into the storehouse 
and there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test. You hear God saying, you, see, you hear what he's saying? God is saying, bring to make sure that my house is good. Put me to the test. Meaning, even if you bring in your last, which I don't preach about, but this is what God is saying. Even if you bring your last to make sure that my house is straight, that's going to be you testing me saying, God, I done brought you my last. How I'm going to live. That's testing me. God is saying, test me. Put me to the test. God says, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Amen. I will rebuke the devourer for, for you so that it would not destroy the fruits of your soil. And your vine in your in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed. For you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. I want you guys to really hone in on what this is saying in verse 11. I will rebuke the devourer from you so that it will not destroy the fruit of your soil. Your soil. If you plant in your garden, this is what I eat from. Today, my investment accounts, my job, my businesses. Everything that which is beneficial to me, my studies in school. God is saying when you bring your offerings and your tithes, your contributions to him. He's going to stop the devourer from causing you to not benefit from what you are investing. Your business is not getting off the floor. Put your money into God. Your job is giving you trouble or you can't get a promotion like you can't. You need more money. God is saying, bring your money to him. Acknowledge that money is his. God say, put him to the test. You bring your little $10, you get a $10 blessing. You bring your blessing. You bring your tithes. You bring your contributions. Contributions means not what you feel like the church needs. What does the church need? I will contribute to the church. This is me saying, God, here, this is what the church needs. Make sure that the church has food. Church is food is what we provide. Make sure the church has all the ways that which it can provide for the community. If I bring everything that the church needs or I bring a contribution to something that the church needs, God says, you put me to the test, I right, watch how I'm going to bless you. Blessing you will mean that, man, sometimes you just always had these little problems. Your car was straight this week, you catch a flat tire next week. Like, you always have these little issues. That's the devourer. That's something that's literally coming to test you. That's literally something trying to take away the fruit of your soil. We have to make sure that we understand that. Those two verses correlate 100%. When you bring your tithes and your contributions to my house, thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Amen? So, to open the floodgates of heaven, what does that look like? Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Thank God we're recording. You guys are not taking notes. I'll be posting this on YouTube at some point this next month. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34. What does it look like, the floodgates of heaven? God says he'll open the floodgates of heaven for you. Matthew chapter, Ma Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 31. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Amen. You're not anxious about tomorrow because you are preparing today. Prepare today. If you get ready today, you get ready so you ain't got, you know what I'm saying? What they say? You stay ready so you ain't got to get ready. And we're going to finish off in Isaiah chapter 55. 
And we're going all around the world. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 and 2. What does it look like? The floodgates of heaven that God is talking about. We just seen that God said that he's taking away your anxiety. You're always tripping out what you're going to eat. You trip about what you're going to drink. You trip about what you're going to wear. God said that's the Gentiles, the people that don't believe in God. That's what they that's what they sit around and complain about. You ain't supposed to be complaining about these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Meaning the food that you need will be added to you. The drinks that you need will be added to you. Everything that you need will be given to you. Now we're going to Isaiah 55, beginning at verse 1. Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2. Open the floodgates. This is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Y'all caught that? It says, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. How do you buy with no money? You understand what the floodgates of heaven looks like? You will have no needs. God says, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich foods. Amen? And, and the fatness basically means in the pleasures. Like in everything that you need. For, and I'm, I'm skipping down to verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down, from heaven and do not return there but water the earth making it bring forth and sprout giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth it shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish what I that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it so if God says that he will open the floods of gate the floodgates of heaven for you those words do not return to him empty. When God speaks, let there be light, there was light. When God speaks, let the waters separate from the land, it's separated. When God speaks and says, let their fruit trees come out, the trees that would spring out fruit for the land, it happens. When God speaks and tells the land, the dirt to give animals, it happens. When God says that he will open the floodgates for your life, he will do it. When God says, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without a price, he got you. Verse 2 is a verse that I think that you guys should definitely highlight in this Isaiah chapter 55. Verse 2, why do you spend your money for what? For that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Why are you wasting your time? Why are you spending your money on things that you don't need? Okay. Malachi 6. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because if it wasn't for that word, y'all would have been up out of here already. If you go through the Old Testament, you'll see many times that God would say, because of the promise that he made, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why y'all still here. He'll let them go under basically in slavery where other, um, like Nebuchadnezzar would be able to come and basically take the people of Israel or Egypt. They find themselves in Egypt going through it because they would turn their backs on God and God would make them pay for it. But God did ne God never wiped them out as he did many nations. So all these things come back to the first statement that I read, and I'm gonna read it again. I wrote it like this. Tithing makes you wealthy. No get rich schemes. You don't give $50 a day to get $100 a more. Like, it's not, it's, that's not what it's about. Tithing is about discipline and priorities. You evaluate your finances as you evaluate your spiritual life. 
What you invest in today is what you will eat from tomorrow. When you invest in foolishness, fleshy desires such as clothes, jewelry, and hairstyles, I probably should have put commas here, but I didn't, you'll gain the temporary fame and notoriety that comes with it. But just know that that's your reward. In that moment, you wear them and all the compliments you receive. After that, it's just collecting dust. No one really cares. When you invest in the kingdom of God, spiritually discerned, such as your health, your future, your life, you'll gain wealth, both spiritually and financially. You leave the rat race, which is just a wheel, going nowhere fast, and you enter into a marathon of growth. No winners or losers, just lessons. Amen? What's up? Um, can you share those notes, please? Um, Put in I the got, chat. I'll think about it. Thank you. There's nobody else, man. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, we have to understand that tithing is meant for us to get better. Tithing is not what you give into the church. Like tithing isn't for the church to just like, I don't know. It's not about a popularity thing. You're not doing it just to make people see. Like there's individuals that give offering tithes. And they want everybody to know, yeah, I gave a $5 last month. That's your blessing. That notoriety you were chasing, like that fame, you want everybody to know that you didn't gave a $1,000 where well, you just got your blessing. That's where it stops right there. Wanted everybody to know you got it. Speak loud. The Bible says what you do with your left hand, you don't need the right hand to know what you're doing. That's why we was never on that. Like when we go feed the homeless, like having cameras and I, I don't like it. I don't feel right because you're not doing it for them for real. You're just doing it so people can see. We have to understand that within this ministry alone, when we go out and feed the homeless, me and my mom getting real blessed by it. People that's not contributing to it, that's not my fault. Y'all are more than free to contribute to what we're already doing. You can contribute with your presence. You can contribute with actually putting money into it. You can contribute by bringing food for us to actually just go give the homeless because those blessings are falling upon the people that's doing it. There's a lot of things that people would like, and I never seen it like this. This is why I never like to do like offering and stuff at a church, but I would hear like grown people come and start telling my mom or tell me directly, like, bro, you stealing my blessing. Like by not letting me invest into what you're doing, you stealing my blessing. Like, bro, let me help. Like this is what people started telling me, like grown men were telling me this and I ain't never look at it like that. But basically we're being selfish with it. So, when we open up the floor for people to come and bring their offerings, we have to understand what that entails. You are not just doing it to show out. You ain't doing it just because the church is telling you to do it. This is free will offerings that we just talked about for the most part. But tithing is something that which is even more important because tithing is what you actually build on. If you have direct deposit, you understand you should take a percentage of that out and put it into your savings account. If you don't do that, you go through something later, keep buying McDonald's, or you keep spending your little $5 and $20 on things that which are not important. You buy Stanley Cups $75 because, you know what I'm saying, they uh, <clears throat> they popular this month. Like, um, we have to on. start understanding <laughs> what we are spending our money on. If you're spending your money on facades or like, you know, things that which are not beneficial to you, you will ask yourself later at the end of the month, man, I need some gas money. I don't have gas money. It's an investment. OK. It doesn't say it like that per se, but OK. That verse, I'd have to go search for. I, I know exactly what you're saying. Well, the, the one that I can probably contribute to that one is basically, um, what does it cost? I mean, what do you get? What is, what is it to gain the whole world and to lose your soul? That's what I take from that. I'm not sure if that's the one that you're talking about, but basically, the greed that you're that you're talking about is like 
seeking the fame and seeking all that stuff. What is it to gain all of that notoriety, but you you forfeit your own soul? So, I mean, I'm just throwing a little shots at the Stanley Cups, but there's a lot of, even me, myself, like there's a lot of things that we spend money on and then you find yourself a month later saying, damn, I need $100, bro. Like, how for the, like, think about it. Where'd you put it? So we got to start investing in things that which are beneficial to us. Um, not only Jewish people, Chinese people, but like there's individuals that which you see them. You see these Jewish guys, they're not dirty, but they have like three or four pairs of shirts, couple pairs of jeans, and they outside. They bank accounts, they have no problems in life, they have nice car, they have nice shoes, but they don't waste their money. You think about the economy, um, black people spend the most money in this economy. Uh, TikTok has caused so much things to become popular. And the moment that it becomes the fad, you put everything into it because you want to be a part of it. So we just got to be more, uh, <sighs> we just got to be more open to growing. What's the verse? Say it. Mm -hmm. And what does it say? Please. Proverbs eleven twenty four. We are the world. We are the children. One gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers one. That's the verse you're talking about? There you go. Proverbs eleven twenty four. 24. Amen. So anybody got any questions, any thoughts, anything that they would like to contribute towards this study today? Yes, no, maybe so. Did, did it ever come back to you? Nah. All right. So with that being said, just be more financially uh responsible. Um and understand that whatever you contribute to the church, contribute to the ministry, it goes a long way. And you don't lose it. You just invested it. The more you invest for anybody that's already started to invest, whether you invest aggressively or you invest moderately. You understand that your investments always come back. And if you're investing in a good business, it comes back with interest that you didn't even expect to happen, dividends and all that stuff. It's the same thing when you invest into ministry, when you invest into the actual going out for souls, trying to help people get the light, trying to help more people get touched or find a relationship with God. It's uh, It goes a long way. So just be more inclined to not just bringing a dollar for when the offering basket goes around a little 50 cents or two dollars we got to start real deal giving offering um and understand what that offering where it goes and how it actually benefits you in the long run so invest in life invest in the kingdom of god invest in yourself and yeah that's it tiding makes you wealthy so since we ain't got no questions we ain't got no thoughts let us uh Stand up and say a prayer. We are the world. We are the children. We are the ones to make the world a place. Want to make a circle? So this first prayer 
is for insight and understanding in our spin. Let us pray for God to give us more discipline to spin wisely as opposed to just spending freely. Let us let us pray for our discipline and spending. My Father, my God, my Savior, Lord Jesus, we come to you at this moment, my Lord Jesus, acknowledging, my Lord, your power, acknowledging, my Lord, your presence in our lives, acknowledging, my Lord, your presence in this room, my Lord, we thank you for the information in which was able to be shared. We thank you for these moments of fellowship. We ask you, my Lord Jesus, at this moment to give us the strength, my Lord Jesus, to be able to say no. Give us, my Lord, the guidance, my Lord Jesus, into knowing where it is that we are putting our financial our finances, my Lord Jesus. We ask you, my Lord Jesus, to guide us, my Lord Jesus, through storms. Guide us, my Lord, through temptation. Guide us, my Lord Jesus, that we are always, my Lord, making decisions that reflect you, reflect, my Lord, the person that we want to be in life, the success that which we are chasing after, my Lord. Help us to invest more, my Lord Jesus, into your spirit, into your message, into your way, my Lord, into your will. Stop investing, my Lord, into our flesh and desires. We ask you, my Lord Jesus, to bless us, my Lord, with understanding, to humble us, my Lord Jesus, that we are at the moments in which we can humble ourselves and not have to be in loss and seeking after help or seeking after assistance. We acknowledge, my Lord, that there are many times when we find ourselves in spiritual problems or in financial problems. It is we that cause it on ourselves. We acknowledge this at this moment, my Lord, and ask that you forgive us of our sins. We ask you, my Lord, to strengthen us, my Lord, with the know-how, my Lord, Jesus, to move forward diligently, my Lord, seeking after you, diligently investing, my Lord. Guys, you are everything and everything is you. You provide, my Lord. As we, my Lord Jesus, decide at this moment, my Lord, to invest more into the kingdom, we ask, my Lord Jesus, that you open the floodgates of heaven upon our lives, my Lord. That you open the floodgates of heaven, my Lord Jesus, in us in our studies, in us in our businesses, in our lives, in our families' lives, my Lord, in our household. And every person that we come across, my Lord Jesus, we can share this message, my Lord, of financial understanding that wealth comes from tithing, and individuals can be blessed and be able to grow with us, my Lord. We need this change in our community, my Lord. And we ask, my Lord, that you let us be the examples that are set. Guide us, my Lord, through it all. Forgive us, my Lord, again. Because in your name we pray, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Sister A, say a prayer for us to get out of here. Young lady, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to see you. By the grace of God, all is well. Y'all have a good night. God bless Miss Keisha.